Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and today we're back with another episode of Lessons Learned in Amateur Astronomy. Now, we've discussed the most important feature of your amateur astronomy and that is the mount that you put your optics on. And in our last episode, we talked about the different parts of the telescope. Today, we're going to talk about the different types of telescopes and why you would choose one over the other. So let's cue up the music and get going. Now obviously the very first type of optics that you can use in amateur astronomy is your Mark I eyeball. You need to get a good field guide of the evening constellations at different times of the year. And this is one that I particularly like. It's called Turn Left at Orion. And one nice thing about it is that it gives very clear pictures of what the major structures in the sky are at any season of the year. And then it goes into detail on each of those different constellations and star patterns. Now of note, if you are an observatory level member of my Patreon, I'll send you one of these for free. Otherwise, you can buy them for 35 bucks a piece and I'll make arrangements for you to get one sent to your house. So just simply getting outside and looking up at the sky and starting to recognize the different constellations and where they are in relationship to each other is your first step in amateur astronomy. But today we're gonna to talk about optics. So let's get the camera off of me and get it on the telescopes where it belongs. Now, the first object that I want to talk about today is going to be astronomical binoculars. These are made by a company called Humel. It starts with a Z. It's a Chinese company, and they are really very affordable. You can get a set of binoculars like these for about $250 new, or if you go to Facebook Marketplace or eBay, you may be able to get them as I did for about $200. They have a 100 millimeter objective lens, and by the way, in my last episode, I did talk about this as being the aperture lens. Its actual name is the objective lens. Thanks to a couple of my viewers for pointing out that mistake that I made. It's the lens that's in the aperture, but the lens itself is actually called the objective. And these binoculars are what are called 25-100 binoculars, which means they have an objective lens of 100 millimeters, and they magnify things about 25 times. The biggest problem is, is they're actually quite heavy and you have to mount them on a stand in order to use them properly. But that shouldn't really stop you because even something as simple as this laser rangefinder, which has a very low magnification lens in it, will help you bring out some details in some of the nebulae and star clusters that you can see in the night sky. A basic set of field glasses that you would use for deer hunting or bird watching would also work as well. Now to just kind of go over how binoculars work, the light comes in the objective end at this end. There are some lenses in here and a prism system down here that brings the light down and then redirects it out here to the eyepieces. Now the next step up from this is going to be a refractor type telescope. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Now this is a basic refractor telescope. It's actually a finder scope for one of my other telescopes. It would go up in a position like this. But what you have is an objective lens, and then you have a tube. Back here you have a mirror, and then you have an eyepiece. On the more elaborate side, you have my 80 millimeter refractor here. Once again, you have an objective lens and a dew shield up front. You have your scope rings and your mount. And then you have your coarse focus and your fine focus, which makes this draw tube go back and forth and focuses the image on this eyepiece. This is a 110 millimeter refractor. Once again, same basic parts. You have your lens cap and your objective lens underneath. In this case, it's a 110 millimeter objective lens. You've got a dew shield. You have your main optical tube assembly. Then you have a focuser in the back. And again, you have your focusing knobs that change your draw tube and focus the image on the eyepiece here in the back. Now, one thing I didn't mention when I talked about using the Mark I eyeball or a pair of binoculars is just a DSL camera. Many of these cameras have telephoto lenses on them, 
Now, if you put those on a white mount, like my Skywatcher mount with the 11 pound capacity, that works very nicely for photographing large objects in space, such as nebulae, the Milky Way, and even constellations. Now, when would you use a refractor telescope? Let's go with the advantages first. They tend to be very clear and bright. They tend to be relatively small and lightweight. They don't require collimation, and we'll learn about that a little bit more later. But the disadvantage is, is they can be a little pricey. This red, green, and blue light has different wavelengths, which means as it goes through one lens, those wavelengths will focus at a slightly different spot. And as a result, when you look at a planet or a star, you may see a little rim of color around it. It's called chromatic aberrancy. To overcome that, what happens is, is that you sometimes put more lenses in the front or along the course of the tube in order to try and assure that each wavelength of light focuses directly at that focus point. That glass can get heavy and that glass can get very expensive. Apochromatic telescope has three or more lenses in the front and it's designed to make all of those wavelengths of light focus at the same spot so that you can focus that spot on your eyepiece or on your camera. Now for a refractor, you can get a decent one for about $500. You can get a nice one for about $1,200. And if you want to go absolutely insane, you can spend 6,000 or more on them. Now the next one that we're going to talk about is the classic Smith cassegrain Telescope or SCT. One of the advantages of this is that it has a very, very large objective lens to it. So it brings in an awful lot of light. The other thing is, because of the way the telescope is designed, it has a very, very long focal length. Whereas the refractors are generally under a thousand millimeters, this one is over 2,500 millimeters in focal length. Now, if you divide that 2,500 by 254 millimeters for this 10 inch scope, you'll find that that is an F10 telescope, which means that it takes a little while longer to get an image with this telescope than something that's like an F4.5, which is what that Eon 110 refractor was. Let me show you the design of an SCT and how it folds the light in order to get that very long focal length. Now the advantage of an SCT is that they are relatively expensive compared to a large refractor. For example, you can get a 10 inch SCT for about 800 or $1,000, whereas a six inch refractor can run you $15,000. Hi Otis. Otis decided to come over and hang out with me for a few minutes. The disadvantage of an SCT is that they're a little complex to use. Because they have a very long focal length, your pointing of this telescope needs to be very precise. Your field of view is tiny, and you want to make sure the object that you're looking for is in that field of view. The other disadvantage of an SCT is the focusing mechanism. The way an SCT is focused is that it has a primary mirror in the back, and it has a secondary mirror in the front. Light comes in the aperture, it reflects off of the primary mirror in the back, comes up to the secondary mirror in the front, and then is reflected back through a hole in the primary mirror coming out right here. Now, in order to focus this, you actually move that primary mirror back and forth, and you do that with this small knob right here. The problem is, is when you move that very large piece of glass back and forth, it tends to wobble as it slides up and down the tube. And as a result of that, the image will shift in your field of view. Let's go and have a look at the next evolution after the Smith cassegrain This telescope is what is called a Ritchie Cratian telescope. And in many ways, it's similar to a Smith cassegrain The difference is, is that a Smith cassegrain has what's called spherical mirrors. In other words, if you were to take a basketball and dip it down in mud, leaving a very spherical depression, that is what the mirror looks like with a Smith cassegrain And a spherical mirror requires something called a corrector plate or a very large plate of glass in the front. The problem with that is that that tends to fog up. Whereas with a Ritchie Cratian, as you can see, there's no corrector in the front. It's just an open tube. Now, like a Smith cassegrain what happens with a Ritchie Cratian is the light comes in the front, it reflects off a primary mirror in the back. Now this mirror, unlike a Smith cassegrain is fixed. It doesn't move. It's also parabolic rather than spherical, which is why you don't need a corrector plate. It's then reflected up to a secondary mirror, which is also 
a parabolic mirror here in the front. And then again, like a Smith Cassegrain, it's reflected straight back into a hole at the back of the telescope, which is here. Here's where the difference is between a Ritchie Crateon and a Smith Cassegrain. A Ritchie Crateon, that light goes through a focusing tube, very much like a refractor. And that focusing tube generally has knobs on it. In this particular case, I've got an electronic focuser. And then you bring it into focus here, and then it's focused on your camera or your eyepiece in the back. Now, this is a very nice system for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have a problem with the corrector plate fogging up on a Smith Cassegrain telescope. There is no corrector plate on a Ritchie Crateon, and as a matter of fact, the entire body of the telescope acts like a dew shield. Second of all, when you do focus, the shift in the image is much smaller. You don't have that classic SCT mirror flop, they call it. Now, both a Ritchie Crateon and a Smith Cassegrain require something called collimation. Now, what collimation means is that you want the light coming in the front of the telescope to be reflected off the primary mirror to exactly the center of the secondary mirror and then reflected straight back into your focuser and eyepiece. Now at any point along that path, one of those mirrors can be a little bit out of square, and as a result, the light path will be shifted a little bit. Bring all of those light paths in exactly as they're supposed to be is called collimating the scope. Ritchie Crateons have to be collimated, so do Smith Cassegrain telescopes. Another type of telescope that you may see quite frequently is called a reflector telescope or a Newtonian telescope, and they require collimation as well. But that's an issue that you have with any scope that involves mirrors. Now, the last one I want to talk about is something called the Rowe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph. This is a high end telescope that is very specialized. An astrograph means that it's only suitable for taking images with a camera, it doesn't even have a place to put an eyepiece. Now, the design of the Rowe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph is very similar to the SCT. It has a movable primary mirror in the back. And what happens is the light comes in through the objective lens, it bounces off of that primary mirror in the back, and then it goes up to where uh, Smith Cassegrain would have a secondary mirror. Now the difference between a RASA and an SCT is that there's no secondary mirror. What it runs into is a series of lenses that focus that image on the front of the telescope where the secondary mirror would be, and that's where you mount the camera you mount the camera literally in the front of the telescope. So let's go over the differences between the telescopes and what they're used for. Refractor telescopes are generally small. They're very sharp and clear. They're moderate to expensive. They're portable and they're lightweight. You would choose a refractor telescope when you want a relatively short focal length to get a very wide field of the sky. So for example, I use my refractors for looking at satellites and looking at nebulae. Now, a reflector telescope or, what the, or another type of uh, telescope called a Dobsonian have very large objective lenses and rather short focal lengths as well. And as a result, you get a very wide field image for these big objects. The other advantage to them is that generally they have mid to lower f-stops. They're, they're moderately to fast telescopes. Now, the Ritchie Crateon and the Smith Cassegrain have got very long focal lengths. They've got big apertures, but the focal lengths are much longer proportionately. As a result, the F ratings of those telescopes are F8 and F10. You need a lot of exposure time in order to get a good image with them. However, they magnify objects tremendously. So if you're looking at galaxies or very small objects like planets, you need that long focal length in order to get the magnification you need to make out any details. With the refractors, you can get a really good look at the moon. With the SCT and the Ritchie Crateon, you can study individual craters in the moon and see the central mountains and such. Now, the last one that I want to talk about is the RASA. The RASA is a special telescope. It is a research-grade telescope. And the reason for that is that it has a very short focal length. The focal length of the RASA is only 40 millimeters longer than the focal length of this little 80 millimeter refractor. The result is that you have an extremely wide field. This refractor has an aperture of 80 millimeters. The RASA has an aperture of 279 millimeters, 11 inches. As a result, it collects an awful lot of light, and it's a very fast telescope. The F rating of a RASA is 2.2.
a one minute exposure with the RASA, in order to get the same exposure on something like the, the F8 Ritchie Crateon, you'd have to do a 15 minute exposure. So you see the amount of light that it collects and how fast it can make an image. It's very nice for asteroid work and taking pictures of large nebulosities. Now the question everybody wants to know, what's the first telescope you should buy? You can get a Newtonian telescope, a reflector telescope. They have relatively large apertures and they have short focal lengths, so they're relatively easy to use. However, they do require collimation and they tend to be very bulky. What I would do is get a small refractor like this 80 millimeter. This will give you a very sharp focus, a bright image, and a wide field of view. Tracking is not quite as essential if you have a very wide field of view. If you're looking at an individual galaxy that's very small or a planet, tracking is very important. We'll go over tracking and how you use computers with telescopes in something called electronic assisted astronomy. That's another series that I'm going to do and we'll go over that when we're done with this one. But the biggest bang for your buck is going to be a mount, a good mount that has a capacity of 28 to 30 pounds and a little nine pound refractor like this. This will get you started in backyard astronomy very nicely without having to have a tremendous amount of knowledge on the workings of telescopes or how to adjust them and everything. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you again for stopping by. Next time we're going to talk about collimation. Bye.